can we just get a hoax that's not touching it? <laughs> if not, just say nobody. Oh, I will change it for you. Yeah. Do all the numbers? Um, I think a couple of the really senior members get three, but like we don't have you know across all the subcommittees, we don't have as many seats to fill. Right. For you guys, I think. So like when we did the so, you could try what beat yourself up in the intro. Because you could be beating yourself over something that I'm like, all I need is an 80% product. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, too, I have, so. mm -hmm. I have a strange, well, probably a bit of a speech pattern as well, but I tend to write a bit weird. I mean, I really like to write in class because I tried to model that, let's be simple. Mm -hmm. Susan Brooke, did you yeah, know, subject to her object. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go down. Yeah. But um, I do recognize it sometimes when I start to turn from like the paper. It comes out really like, that's not even in English. That's what it says. I think um, people have to um, <laughs> sit on this side. Oh, <laughs> It's like Adrian writes on the wall, so the clear she's gonna be she's gonna be better and faster. You know, I don't like that. No, that's a good because in college I had a professor. Yeah, it did not go well. Like everything she gave you feedback wise was horrible about my writing, and then it's like you shut down. And so it's it's devastating. Yeah. No, I sit back and then if he wants to. To know uh, if we need to make money. But yeah, so I, uh, I don't know that I've ever felt totally comfortable with it, <laughs> which doesn't make it any better because I'm like, ah. <laughs> so that's two classes that took people to some college. That's still really good. I was like, please. Yeah, but I had to take a couple of people. Oh, the tallest grade that I ever made. Ooh, they would tra 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 traumatize me. <laughs> I gave them that one. Have a button for the slides. I've got the mouse. Well, you have the mouse. Okay. I can do it for you from here. Everything on here, David, except I just have to check this one out. <laughs> I'm not sure it was hit by a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think he's just going to go. Okay, the committee uh, will come to order. Uh, this morning I'd like to welcome to the subcommittee the Deputy Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt.
Our hearing today will address the Department of Interior's fiscal year 2018 hurricane recovery supplemental request submitted to the committee by OMB on November 17th. I should say hurricane fire recovery supplemental request submitted to the committee on OMB on November 17th. Just to ad lib on that one. As you know, Mr. Secretary, oversight is a critical priority of this subcommittee. As the Appropriations Committee prepares the next uh, supplemental for consideration by the House, it's important that we closely examine the various Department of Interior priorities uh, included in the administration's request. We look forward to hearing in greater detail from you today based upon both storm damage assessments conducted to date as well from your recent firsthand observations on the ground about specific hurricane related needs in the states and territories affected by hurricanes Harvey, Irma and Maria. We understand that storm damage assessments particularly in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are ongoing. We also hope you can shed some light on what we might expect uh, estimates on remaining interior related needs that may be addressed in the future proposal. According to information we have received to date, the Fish and Wildlife Service sustained major damage at 41 agency sites, mostly national wildlife refuges. The National Park Service incurred damage at 21 national parks, preserves, and national monuments. The United States Geological uh, Survey sustained damage to over 200 pieces of equipment including stream gauges, coral reef monitoring, and seismic monitoring equipment. The challenges uh, growing out of these hurricane events include cleanup, debris removal, significant infrastructure repairs, including visitor centers, ranger stations, waste water treatment facilities, employee housing, roads, bridges, campgrounds, and environmental assessment work needed to inform recovery and rebuilding efforts. Our committee stands ready to assist the department in responding to these needs. Overall, the President's fiscal year 2018 supplemental request seeks a total of $469 million uh, for the department, including $210.6 million for the Fish and Wildlife Service, $225.1 million for the National Park Service, and $32.9 million for the United States Geolog uh, Geological Survey. Our committee is examining the administration's request account by account, line by line. Your testimony today will help guide this subcommittee's response. In a subcommittee briefing prior to Thanksgiving, U.S. Virgin Islands Governor Kenneth Mapp brought to our attention many of the challenges facing the Virgin Islands. He painted a portrait of a largely damaged infrastructure but of a resilient population of Americas eager to rebuild in the aftermath of these historic hurricanes. Among other priorities, Governor Mapp emphasized the importance of long-term recovery of Canal Bay on St. John, specifically the need to secure a long-term extension of an agreement between the operator of the Canal Bay Resort and the National Park Service. He pointed to this as a critical piece of the, to rebuilding the economy and putting 500 people back to work in the Virgin Islands. The subcommittee would benefit from your perspective on the status of these ongoing negotiations. In closing, the subcommittee couldn't do its work without the talented people sitting behind you. Thanks to each of you for all that you do. With that, I'm happy to yield to the gentlelady from Minnesota, Mrs. McCollum, for any remarks you would like to make. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Deputy Secretary Bernard, I'm glad that you're here um, joining uh, all of us today. I welcome you for your first public hearing before the committee. Uh, and as the chairman pointed out, we will be delving into and discussing the details of the administration's most uh, recent request for supplemental. The request is to identify needs caused by the historic widespread destruction of the hurricanes and uh, also wildland fires that our country has experienced uh, this year. Uh, unfortunately, the Trump's ad um, administration's latest supplemental requests fall short in many areas, including education and in housing. And I'm taken back that the Trump administration um, appears to want to make uh, our fellow citizens in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands wait even longer to rebuild their homes and their lives. Uh, specifically to your department, I'm disappointed that no funding was requested for the Office of Insular Affairs, which plays a unique role in the federal government's coordinating and federal responsibilities for the territories. The very lives and livelihoods of our fellow citizens um, are going to um, 
depend upon the Office of Insular Affairs uh, getting its job done efficiently, effectively, and right. I believe that the office also has special technical uh, ex uh, expertise, which could be a real significant asset in the recovery of the U.S. Virgin Islands. The supplemental request for the Department of Interior is $469 million. These funds are for equipment, replacement, removing debris and hazardous materials, and repairing and renovating the national parks and national wild refuge. The hurricanes caused profound damage to the natural landscapes and have compounded damages which have occurred in past storm events, especially at El Yuko uh, Rainforest, which is a national treasure. It was dec decimated. Um, the destruction was catastrophic. Um, and that's going to make that this forest uh, have uh, years, decades, um, uh, before it recovers to the harm to its ecosystem. But that's also going to have a direct impact on the economy. and. Uh, it, because the economy of that, that rainforest really is interdependent with the lives and livelihoods of the people from Puerto Rico. But I also am very concerned about um, what the uh, department is doing for the uh, threatened uh, species, especially the Puerto Rican parrot, which we saw a little bit in uh, the U.S. forest budget yesterday about what they were going to do to try to stabilize that population. So I look forward to hearing from you today, but I have more questions, but I'm anxious to hear about your requests and what future plans you might have for the Department of Interior to accomplish the recovery and restoration. Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for the time for your opening category, and I also um, have uh, some information along with Ms. Pingree from uh, the delegate from the Virgin Islands that um, we will either be asking questions or submitting those questions for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you may proceed with your opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today um, to discuss the administration's request for the Department of the Interior. This is my first uh, appearance before you since I was confirmed, and I look forward to working with each of you during my tenure. Before I um, begin discussing our request, I think I should recognize that all our thoughts, prayers, and hearts are with the uh, victims of Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. The Secretary, um, Assistant Secretary of Affa uh, Insular Affairs, Doug Dominich, who is with me today, and I have each traveled to uh, hurricane-impacted zones and seen many of the consequences and devastation of the storms. Uh, to be honest, um, the personal and private sector loss is uh, jaw-droppingly tragic. Um, I would be remiss if I did not tell you what a privilege it is to work uh, with the individuals who volunteered to deploy as part of incident management teams. Interior deployed about 560 uh, volunteers on 31 FEMA mission assignments as part of the immediate response. And obviously we have folks uh, working on the recovery as we speak. Many of our employees were hurricane victims themselves, um, and they helped to serve not only the immediate needs of Interior's mission, but more, more importantly, the uh, broader needs of their community. We are moving quickly with the help of volunteers and partners to reopen our facilities. We recognize these areas provide important economic support and in many cases are integral to the neighboring communities. Last week, the Secretary announced the reopening of portions of San Juan National Historic Site and, Virgin I and the Virgin Islands National Park, as well as Kristensted National Historic Site and Buck Island uh, Reef National Monument on St. Croix. As of today, all National Wildlife Refuge and National Park areas in the continental U.S. are either open uh, fully or um, with limited hours and partial closures. All refuges in the Caribbean islands are starting to potentially reopen for public use. Portions of San Juan National Historic Site remain closed, but key areas uh, such as um, El Moro Castle are now uh, open. As we developed this request, we were mindful that the resources of the United States are finite. My own consideration was whether the funds were truly needed or whether they might be better spent directly helping the people who had been impacted. That said, the facilities we administer must be addressed to be made safe and functional. Equally, the tools the public rely on uh, us for, such as data from USGS stream gauges, must be made functional and accurate. 
Our request, um, as the chairman said, amounts to uh, 468.7 million, which I think if you round up is 469. Um, and uh, that reflects the multitude of damages. Uh, these hurricanes impacted roughly 150 managed facilities of interiors. And those are most high, easily highlighted on the charts um, that I think you have in your packet, um, hopefully. Um, and I just wanted to highlight them very quickly. Um, the first slide is just simply where would the money go? Um, and that should be um, relatively self-explanatory. But um, it, I think it does, it is helpful in seeing the relative um, scope of the impacts. I have extras if you don't need one. Um, uh, the second slide is really a slide of um, if you can slip, uh, is really uh, who within the Department of the Interior would the money go to? And you can see that 45% um, would go to the Fish and Wildlife Service, 48% to the National Park Service, and 7% to the Geological Survey. Um, the next slide, and I, I don't know if this one will show up there very well, but I wanted you to see this, is, this, this chart, even though it's very busy, um, is an indication of kind of what happens with USGS in an event like this. The black dots are the dots where we would say the, it's my understanding, the black dots are where we'd say our data is very good. Um, the, the dots that are just a triangle with red are those where our data might be not too far off, but we still have to do modeling to be um, comfortable with it. And uh, those dots that are black, a dot with a red triangle uh, around it, are those where we're basically guessing. And this is because this storm event was so significant that it has actually changed the landforms of these uh, streams and rivers. And so um, not only do the gauges need to be replaced, but data needs to be collected to um, ensure that, that the calculations that USGS makes are are accurate. And it also, I think, shows kind of the scope of the hidden role that Interior often has um, within agencies. Um, I, don't, I know I'm running close to my five minutes probably, so let's flip to the next uh, slide quickly. Um, this is, a, I, I, was per, I personally was at this site um, in the Everglades. I guess my time is probably up. Um, the, um, the Everglades slide, th this is a great example. On the left, is uh, the visitor center that has basically been condemned as a result of this um, effects uh, from the storm. And on the right is uh, a maintenance uh, shed that's obviously been devastated, as you can see. The next slide is a really interesting slide. Uh, this is a um, uh, employee housing on the Virgin Islands. And when you look at that slide, it looks like a disaster, which it obviously is. But what happened here is the door uh, failed on this house. Um, water came in the door and literally blew the roof and the wall off the building. It's just unbelievable. Uh, the next two slides we can scroll through quickly. They're typically what you'd expect at a, a, a refuge in terms of things that need to be um, restored for both safety and access. And that really is what makes up our primary um, point of the request. Let me say um, specifically in regards to um, the Insular Affairs um, component and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I um, have spent a lot of time thinking about the role that Interior plays with the Insular Affairs. We are very cognizant of it, and I want to be very candid with you. I think the, the role, the unique capability, I mean, you use the words specific, specific technical uh, expertise. I personally think that that unique capability is a very enhanced understanding of how the government um, in the USVI works, an understanding of uh, both the challenges the government will face and um, there. And, um, and I really believe that Insular Affairs specific technical skill for these particular events is really the expertise in serving almost as a liaison between the um, recovery people and the, um, and the, um, the government uh, ensuring, because this is a for, for the, b both here and in Puerto Rico, I think the scale of what we're dealing with is very different 
given the competency of the um, other governmental entities and what we're likely to bear, we have to recognize that this is going to have a tremendous effect on their um, revenue streams um, for the governments as well as in the private sector. And these are very, very big issues. I think that's why um, the administration is um, suggesting that they want to work with Congress on specific requests because of the unique nature. But I think for Interior itself, our technical skill is really most specifically devoted to um, helping educate the other federal agencies as to um, uh, the, the, the way um, the USVI uh, governmental structures work and um, also educating the, um, the, gover the government of USVI on that and also helping us ensure that, um, you know, surprising missteps are not simply made. And so I just put that forward. I'm happy to answer any of your questions and I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the committee has been working closely with your department and, as I mentioned earlier, recently met with the Governor of the Virgin Islands. It's our understanding that damage assessments, particularly in the Caribbean Basin, are ongoing. My first question is really three questions, so bear with me. First, broadly speaking, have damage assessments been completed in Texas, Florida, and other states? Do the Department of Interior related funding requirements contained in OMB's supplemental submission address all of the post-hurricane needs in Texas, Florida, and other states on the mainland. Secondly, to what extent does the supplemental request, uh, request address interior-related needs in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? What damage assessments have been completed and what remains outstanding at this time? And lastly, can you provide a timeline on we'll likely know the full scope of the damage in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? At this stage, are you able to, to quantify in general terms what additional funding needs to, are likely to be requested for the department in a future supplemental funding bill? You get all that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, all right. So let me take, let me take my shot. Um, first, um, I don't know if, if absolutely all assessments are down because some assessments are continuing. But in general, what I've found so far in this process is as assessments come in, our estimates tend to go down, which means that we probably um, took a very conservative approach right at the beginning. So um, I think particularly for Texas, Florida, um, um, uh, I, I think that we're likely to see a meaningful change, and certainly not a meaningful change upward. Um, for um, uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. No, no. I believe me, I am not. Uh, I, I am limited to the Department of the Interior in terms of my knowledge base. Um, for uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, for our facilities, um, I feel pretty good about the estimates. Came frankly, and I personally visited a lot of those facilities. Um, stream gauging, um, there's probably some questions of, um, but in terms of our structural um, effects, there's, there are some uncertainties like um, some water treatment facilities and other things that, that maybe as we get in and look at the electronics um, and the impact of saltwater intrusion, those numbers could go up, frankly. Um, but, I, but I feel relatively confident about them. Um, when will all our assessments be done? I think that that's a little bit of a work in progress. We're trying to get them done as quickly as possible because we're trying to reopen facilities to the extent we haven't. Um, but I don't, th I don't think we're likely to be surprised by big structural damage or other things like that. What could change is our estimates of whether or not um, you know, some of these are very remote locations and whether we're right on our estimates of what it would take to, to actually uh, fix them. So that's my best shot at your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you. Any uh, additional information, we'll get in touch with you. For that, uh, Ms. McCollum. Uh, thank you. There's lots of questions, but I'm going to um, just focus on, on three things um, really quickly. As we're moving forward and as you're putting um, 
uh, budgets together, and this this probably falls maybe a little more into insular affairs a little bit. Uh, looking back in what Congresses have done in the past for our fellow citizens, um, during Hurricane Sandy, Congress appropriated $360 million in disaster relief appropriations. Um, and there were resiliency projects in there, and that they found that to be a very cost-effective um, investment. So one of the questions I have is, um, are you going to have, or does this include resiliency projects? Uh, another thing that um, we have done both in Hurricane uh, Sandy and Katrina, Congress provided uh, uh, $50 million for historic preservation. And this goes back to the livelihoods and uh, lives and um, the, his, you know, the importance of uh, these territories to the United States. So uh, do we have any um, historic pres uh, preservation uh, fund uh, money um, uh, in there? Um, so if you could answer that. And then the next question, because I'm kind of being a little more specific than you said you're pulling things together yet. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, education, uh, we have the uh, Hurricane uh, Maria with the Miccosukee uh, tribe down in Florida. Could you tell the committee if um, the K-12 uh, building, which I have been in, what kind of shape it's in? Uh, did they uh, do they need any uh, funding? Do, have you done what uh, needs to be for um, the tribe in that educational setting? And then uh, on the Virgin Islands. 60% uh, of St. John Island uh, um, is a national park, and there was a lot of damage inflicted uh, to the school, and it's going to require new, new construction. You're also going to be doing con some construction, some road work, and the rest. And one of the things that we have been looking on is ways to collaborate and create win-wins. And um, we're wondering if you're talking to the Department of Education about what should be happening with the construction of a new school. I think there's an opportunity to have a school of excellence. We, we talked about it a little bit uh, before when um, the Deputy Secretary was, was here uh, of really, uh, really kind of getting this, getting this right for the islands, for the students, for the future education of our fellow citizens, and also for the best use of taxpayers' dollars. So if you could just comment briefly where you might be on those, or if they're going to be in future supplementals. Sure. So I, I think we can uh, hit most of those. First on resiliency, we have spent um, a lot of time thinking about um, ensuring that we harden our facilities that, um, you know, to the extent that cables can be buried, um, they're buried so that we don't have to replace poles going forward, um, ensuring that we utilize uh, technologies to um, make sure that, I mean, invariably there will be a hurricane here again, um, and, and make sure that we're not continually asking you for those types of monies. In regards to historic preservation, it's uh, my understanding that the request um, is, is entirely for 106 um, um, monies, if you will. It's, it is not a request for um, brick and mortar costs for private uh, residents um, or private historic uh, facilities. And um, that, that is the way I believe our request is structured. So it, follow up on that? My, my question was for that is is that the end or future supplementals even if you don't have a dollar amount? so, I, so you, I, are you done with the discussion I don't I don't um, anticipate that we would be uh, seeking a supplemental uh, requesting money for private residences um, and and those types of things um, as it relates to historic properties um, I would not expect interior to do that regarding um, education um, I'm not specifically aware of the Miccosukee School, but I'm happy to get back to you on that this afternoon. Uh, regarding the VI School, I, I am somewhat familiar with that, and I think that there are some um, uh, discussions and dialogue that need to occur with the governor as well in terms of on specific <laughs> pieces of property and others, other type things uh, regarding location. We're happy to talk to the Department of Education about it, about it but I don't think that's functionally the um, the, the, the immediate challenge as it relates. I think it's more of um, um, perspectives on location and uh, property. Well, I think 
Mr. Chair, I would just say that getting a school up and running, and I know you didn't mean it this way, so I'm clarifying it for the record, is something of immediate need. I, I don't, I completely agree with that. It, I, um, I, fig I figured you I just wanted to be clear. The federal government has, and there's a role other governmental entities have as well. Mr. Simpson. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned during your uh, opening statement that uh, I can't remember how many, 800 and some odd volunteers from the Department of Interior. By volunteers, do you mean uh, Department of Interior employees that volunteered to go down there? That's exactly what I mean, sir. Okay. Um, obviously, there have been volunteer efforts of yeah. folks that, you know, um, have just helped. But what, right. what I was specifically referring to there is the 560 people who've volunteered yeah. to go um, into these areas. And, you know, look, um, power, uh, yeah. water, I mean, it's challenging conditions. Yep. And, and they, they're, um, they're up for it, and um, they're motivated, and they're doing an incredible job. We have folks from Grand Tetons. We brought in uh, smoke jumpers to actually clear some of the roads. Um, you know, it's they they really made a huge difference, but um, you know, yeah. they they didn't have to step up. And we thank them for that, and thank and if you would thank them for, for this committee that, uh, for the for the effort that they're doing down there. You mentioned 31 FEMA missions that you've uh, participated in. That means FEMA has paid for these. Well, I think the way it works technically is um, FEMA makes an assignment, gives it to us, and then we carry it out. And as part of that, I think it is reimbursed through FEMA as, uh, I don't want to say an entitlement, but, yeah. but there is some sort of reimbursement agreement that deals what with it. What has this uh, done to, not, not the FEMA part, but what, what has happened to the Interior's budget because of costs that are not reimbursed by FEMA, you said that uh, there were volunteers from from uh, uh, Teton National Park and other places. Is there work there that's not being done because we have had to redirect resources to to this? And what's been the impact on the Department of Interior overall? So for our own facilities, um, the the part of that is some of our requests, and um, that work is, um, uh, you know, we we are. Uh, the way the way FEMA works is FEMA does kind of the public stuff for our own facilities we are expected to deal with those and then come to you and that's what we have done and there have been some really interesting efforts for example um, uh, it turns out that um, Dry Tortugas has a boat uh, the Jefferson we have actually used that to get supplies to um, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands so there has been a lot of our own activity that isn't part of those 31 missions and that that is stuff that we ask you for um, to will this supplemental <coughs> is, it, is it not yeah will it make you whole yeah, so that we can actually so that the activities that we expect the Department of that, Interior to do That's will absolutely my goal. Like, okay. this is not at all to take away from those. And, and what really happened, I mean, candidly, is, you know, a fire crew in Grand Tetons right now, there's snow. Right. So, um, so they're getting to spend uh, some, some time in the, in the Virgin Islands doing really hard work in a hot, um, uh, very, very different temperate environment. But that's what they were willing to do. Thank you. Ms. Pengree. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for being here today. We've, um, I think as a committee, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member, for spending so much time on this. I think um, getting to know better from the, uh, the delegate and the governor recently about some of the issues that they're facing was very helpful to us. And um, I think dealing with matters of the territory, as I'm sure you know in your new position, seems so complicated and confusing. Um, and each one's treated differently, and there's a whole variety of things. So. Um, I'm just going to kind of ask you a general question because uh, some of these things I'm just still trying to figure out. Um, but it's my understanding, and some of this I, I got from um, Representative Plaskett, the questions that she suggested to uh, the ranking member and I, um, that some things obviously are treated differently for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And in the administration's request, um, there is a... Uh, a, a waiver of the Stafford Act um, in order to rebuild infrastructure with more resiliency, and you've already talked a little bit about resiliency, and the request specifically states, for Puerto Rico in particular, the administration seeks as part of this request authority to provide public assistance under the Stafford Act without limitation of pre-disaster condition and causation. Um, now, that doesn't apply to the Virgin Islands, and I know this is 
more complex than I completely understand because some things are FEMA and some things are Homeland Security, but obviously changes are attempting to be made. And in your role, um, you know, as kind of the only agency that, in a sense, cares about the comprehensive picture of the territories, um, can you explain those differences to me and maybe talk a little bit more um, in depth about some of the things you kind of alluded to, the challenges that, um, you know, it's a... Uh, there's specific expertise that other federal agencies or the Department of Interior have that just aren't available, um, particularly in the Virgin Islands, to the existing government. People are dealing with many of their own issues. Um, there was already a lot of debt and difficulty going on there. So I, I guess I'd like to get a little more in-depth picture of how you see both how the territories are being treated differently and then also how you see some of that funding applying. So. So um, the first thing I would say is I don't think um, that specific provision is part of the Department of the Interior's uh, specific request. And so I, I can't speak specifically to the distinction, but I can tell you this from perspective. It wouldn't surprise me that there might be a perspective that that um, authority should, was thought through for Puerto Rico and not necessarily um, thought through uh, in the Virgin Islands. And the administration, frankly, may be very supportive of the of that modification, if that's what you're asking. The, the difference is really one of magnitude, I think. Um, there are 3.4 million people in Puerto Rico, and it's a very s significant cir uh, circumstance. And there's 100, approximately 100,000 people in the US Virgin Islands. It's also a very significant circumstance. Um, Puerto Rico's financial situation is much more visible. Congress has dealt with it. But you need to understand that USVI, although it's not in that particular um, <coughs> uh, state, is, um, is, is very fragile itself. And in both of these places, uh, from my perspective, this is a incredibly serious challenge in that just, just for a minute think of state revenues dropping very, very significantly. Um, tax revenue not coming in because there's not uh, an economic uh, factor, and people not having the ability to get paid from their jobs. This is a, a very serious event, and it is going to require a lot of work between the administration and your body um, in helping it. And I can tell you um, emphatically that the administration is very, very concerned about this. Look, I've, I've spent time in these places, um, and, and uh, in my testimony I say that the personal toll is uh, jaw-dropping, and it is. Um, the, just the amount of debris and trash is jaw-dropping. Um, but the impact to people's lives is very real, and this is going to be, it is going to require both the executive branch and the uh, Congress to treat this in a way that's somewhat different than we normally <coughs> we treat other um, events. And so that's just my um, unscripted answer to your general question. <laughs> well, I appreciate your unscripted answer, and I, I completely concur. I think it's a unique situation. And um, I guess I would suggest that well, I know it's hard to get all the estimates together. I notice one um, thing is that the um, assistance to the territories program within the department's budget, um, it was originally cut. It's been restored, I think, in the House. But, I mean, that's one place where it seems to me we could be looking at funding to help with some of these things that aren't just about that. And I guess I'd ask you about that. And I would also say in terms of you're absolutely right. Um, we have to look at this a little bit differently, or I would suggest I think you're right. And um, and Congress needs to play a role in it, but partly Congress can only play a role if it's really clear from the department where the needs are. And um, while, again, I'd say some of these things end up in other budgets and other places, um, you know, you're the only department that cares about what's the long-term future and how do you put all those pieces together. Um, so I would think that, you know, kind of your oversight on where the funding comes from and making sure it's all there is really critically important. I think a lot of people care, I, so I don't want to minimize that. I think everybody's heart goes out to these folks. Um, historically, one of the areas uh, where we've seen your committee um, deal with some of the insular affairs impacts are on the matching side of the 
um, the FEMA type grants. That's not in our request, but that's something uh, to have a discussion about. And may, it may not even be something to have a discussion about in your committee. That's, uh, it may be somewhere else. I don't know that, and I'm try not trying <laughs> to impose that. But um, I really believe, and, uh, and I want you to know that I've spent a lot of time um, understanding capacity and thinking about this. And the Insular Affairs Office is a relatively small office, <laughs> um, and it has tremendous expertise in knowing um, and having relationships in those communities. I um, want to um, uh, make sure that if you put money in those programs that we can uh, fully are capable of administering them. And I really believe that they are, they are their technical expertise is in helping the government of um, the Virgin Islands and the federal government understand each other um, to not make missteps for Great. what it's worth. Well, thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. And Mr. Deputy Secretary, in your written testimony, uh, I believe you said you had the opportunity to see firsthand the problems that were there. This isn't a trick question. Had you been down prior to this so you could appreciate how much was devastated? Um, Number one, I have, I've, I'd never gone to the, the U.S. Virgin Islands before I went, um, or I think even to the Feta, uh, Florida Everglades. Um, but I will tell you this, that the devastation is uh, obvious and apparent. Um, when you fly over, um, when you fly into these islands, there are um, a multitude of houses, and I mean like every other house, has a new, brand new blue tarp. Um, when you drive down the road, um, Walls are gone. Right. Um, it, you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize it got hammered. No, I, I, I'm just wondering because having had the opportunity to be there before and just seeing the pictures of it with now, obviously there's some utter devastation there. And you can appreciate that there's private enterprise that is involved and has made part of the islands as well as on St. John we have so much of the National Park Service. But also uh, on the island, there's a certain Keneal Bay. Did you have the opportunity to visit there? I absolutely did. They have more than 500 employees, and they bring 15,000 guests to St. John's. I was over there a year ago, November, and, and had a chance to, to look at it. <clears throat> and, and they account for approximately $65 million in annual spending uh, on the island. Uh, they operate under a retained use state with the National Park Service, and that expires in September 2023. And in the last seven years, no lease has been agreed upon, and the lease negotiations have crawled along, obviously with the destruction that's there. And for, for them to put the money in and continue to not only rehab what they have, but continue to exist, they were asking for a 60-year uh, uh, lease to be amended to that. Uh, do you find those to be troublesome for some reason or, or a problem? Um. Uh, as a matter of policy, um, uh, no. I, I will tell you this. Number one, I, I've been to Camille Bay. I, I specifically went there. I think if you've been there before, you would be um, troubled if you returned. I don't think it would look at all like you um, remember. Well, the pictures um, I saw made it almost look like it was a, set up as a base since they were the only ones who had a, a working package plant and, and they had the helicopters that they were landing. To, to I, I'm sure they food. played a, a significant role. And I, uh, but, but here's what I would say. Um, Number one, the worst thing we could do is end up having the park service have that facility and not have anyone operating right. up. So, so that that would be that's a, that's the worst case scenario. Um, in terms of the 60 years, I have to say this honestly, you know, our author we have we have certain authorities for leasing, et cetera, that have certain time horizons. Those time horizons might not line up with um, the investment. Um, calculations anyone has to make to make it what will be a very large capital investment and um, and I, I assume and mr. Calvert and others would know this better than me um, I assume that you know they're looking to um, achieve um, a rate of return on a time horizon that makes sense for them the the other thing that I think would be tr worrisome for them and and probably is one of the reasons they would want to spend time visiting with you is the timing and uncertainty of anything we do. It could take a long time. So I think in terms of finalizing an agreement and getting it done, and so for, I think that you know, one thing, 
we need to think about is number one, we don't want this, like we don't want it back in a meaningful way. Um, number two, um, it's in all of our interest to get this up and running quickly. So the quicker there's certainty, the better. Um, number three, we're not investors, so we don't know what the magical time horizon is, but I'm sure that that's something we're happy to debate. And to, to the extent we have authority, we're happy to work within that authority. And to the extent we're not, we don't have the authority, then it's kind of your job. So well, I, I believe that uh, I believe in public-private partnerships like that, and uh, as such, and the fact that somebody's willing to invest private money to fix up our facilities, uh, they obviously need uh, their rate of return so they can give money back to their investors because uh, this isn't manna; it's not just dropping from the heavens for us. I completely do. agree with you, sir. But I believe that the current terms are 40 years now, so they're ex asking you to, uh, uh, and if you can't do it, if it needs to be us, then I'd appreciate knowing where we have to go to, to allow this because you it's know, something that's... I, I, I don't want to try and figure out their positioning for us, but I, but I think it is, there's a window of time element and different, different agreements have different um, conditions and expectations and, right. and their, their use agreement may, may require your help if that's um, the model and, the, and that's just the way it is. Is it fair to say you're amenable to at least the discussion? Out, beyond amenable. Great. Now, when you get down to, I, you asked for the money here, and I noticed that, uh, you know, in following up on Chairman Simpson's uh, question, you know, some of this you say you're directed by FEMA to do, and, and, and so you do that, and you're reimbursed. How long is the delay, or is there any delay in the reimbursement between the works you're performing and the payments you're making, and you're receiving this money? Is it a month? Is it two months? Is it immediate? Well, first off, the, the, those events aren't covered in our supplemental um, in terms of the I get it. FEMA response efforts. But you're still I don't, I don't think it's. Um, I don't think the delay is, is so significant that the agency has come to me and said, please help us with this. So I think it's almost like a, in, I don't want to say an entitlement, but I think that mm -hmm. that part of the system works okay. Do you contract with private uh, uh, partners or private contractors then to help do some of this repair work and, and cleanup work or do you rely on it all in house or because I was there um, some de devastation to Cinnamon Bay and, and some of these other properties that were on so I noticed the supervisors uh, buildings and stuff I have so almost all of that is um, I mean there will be there absolutely in terms of the recovery effort um, there will undoubtedly con be contracting for uh, a good amount of that um, in terms of the uh, response efforts, I don't believe that Interior in any of their individual responses have used uh, contractors to date. Um, and I don't think we normally would, but I would have to check and get back to you on that with absolute certainty. Um, no, no one can predict when these things occur, obviously, but it, when we're taking these efforts in restoration, are you doing anything to be preventative for God forbid another one coming next year or five years from now as we're building back up? Yeah, well, I think that that's, um, that's a key factor in how we look at all of these um, upgrades. Um, we, we have to look at them and say, as we're making this new investment, how do we make them hardened, resilient? Um, should we have things that you can pack up and move? I mean, these are the questions that we need to answer as we develop new structures, should our, our our communications lines and our electric lines be, be buried to the extent they can. Those are the things that we absolutely will incorporate in our thinking about um, new facilities. Some of these repairs are just simply, you know, the bathroom of a place um, of, of a broader building was impacted. And so in those, you know, we're not looking at a major uh, uh, rehardening, if you will. But, but the one photograph you show here, I mean, it, I, I toured that facility. That, that's. Uh, <laughs> That looks like a, a lot of work for the in Department of Interior. Uh, I mean, I would think private contracts would be necessary to oh, come Oh, absolutely. Help you fix those uh, uh, up. Yeah, that's my. Those will absolutely be. I mean, there will be pri uh, significant private contracting involved in the, the recovery. For lack of a better term, you're going to farm that out. You're not using Department of Interior employees uh, to do that. You're going to have to. There are, you're going to have to farm. There it are out. certain things that an Interior employees may very well do, but a lot of it will. A ton of it will be contracted out. Okay. I'm sorry if I misrepresented you. No, no, no. I, I, I'm trying to be helpful. I'm not like I say it wasn't. These were trick questions. But yeah, obviously you can only do so much in house, and so much you have to farm out. And you, you've got a lot of work that needs to be done. So I appreciate what you're doing. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, 
and I know the resource committee is uh, looking into this uh, lease also. And I can, from my own experience, I would say that um, to develop something like that on an, on an island where you may have a disaster again in two years or 20 years or maybe not, I mean, it, that's a significant risk. So that's something to, you don't want to lose a tenant and end up with a vacant piece of property either. So whoever you lose it to. But I don't think a 60-year lease, from my perspective, is unreasonable. Obviously, the governor feels that way also. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for uh, being with us. I actually want to um, kind of hop on where Mr. Joyce ended and uh, some of the resiliency questions that uh, Ms. Pingree had. Um, and I'm particularly interested in in, uh, in green infrastructure that might actually mitigate some of the damage. We heard from Fish and Wildlife that green infrastructure projects um, on some of the wildlife ref refuges actually help protect some of the inland areas uh, and, and reduce uh, some of the damage. Um, I guess the McFadden National Wildlife Refuge has a dune system um, that protected the Port Arthur refinery. Um, and that mitigated some of the damage uh, to um, the, uh, the Port of Beaumont, which is the busiest uh, military port that we have. Uh, I, I guess, you know, and we see this conversation in my neck of the woods too, this notion that natural infrastructure might actually be a good buffer to some of the damage. To, to what extent is that part of this supplemental request? And I guess beyond that, I'm just curious if you have thoughts about what we could do to incent more of that green infrastructure development um, to promote not just conservation, but also to try to mitigate some of the damage when these events occur? So um, I appreciate that question. Um, and let me give you a, an answer that's probably not very politic. Um, and that is this. Um, when, I, when I received our request for uh, this budget, I went through them line by line. And here's the factors I used. Number one, we need to take care of what we have uh, responsibly. But number two, this might be, the supplemental I assume is a finite amount of money. And I know that people don't have homes, um, jobs, and if, if we're taking a, a dollar out of somebody else's pocket, I wanted to make sure I was comfortable with it. And so this request represents the stuff that I believe we need, absolutely need to do. Um, I think that there is a lot of, um, legitimate debate that can talk about what, what should our programs be and should we use uh, land morphology and other things for um, hardening facilities and I don't have any qualm about that. I'm just not entirely sure that that is a, um, a supplemental emergency type discussion as much as a discussion with all of you and our other about, about the benefit of uh, of having these programs on a regular basis and making them part of our ongoing mm -hmm. regular program. Do you have thoughts about how we would do that as part of an ongoing regular program? I would say I'm not an expert, but um, you know, we would devise up a program, pick some test sites, and do it. And I know it has been done in other hurricanes. If, if the gentleman would yield, yeah, go for it. That's what my question was about Sandy. Some of the exact things that Mr. Kilmer was asking, this Congress said. It was the right thing to do um, to mitigate uh, future problems. So I think the Congress has shown um, that that we do see um, a, a value to taxpayers in in, in doing that. So I think I thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, the, the other question I want to ask about was just how much funding set aside for within the supplemental for habitat restoration. Um, uh, Obviously, there was a lot of damage to some of the refuges from the storms, um, and was also curious whether there's uh, that was uh, covered within the areas damaged by the wildfires out west too. Uh, I'll have to get you a specific uh, number. I think that most of these numbers are for uh, facilities, mm -hmm. debris removal, equipment. Um, you know, I would say that I spent a lot as I was working through the Everglades. I would say that the. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that the, um, the environment itself held up pretty well. Our facilities, um, not so much. Yep. Um, so that, that is the truth of the matter. I also want to respond back to the Miccosukee Indian School. I've been informed that it was not damaged during the hurricane, as a matter of fact. The electricity was off for a little while, though. Thanks, Chairman. I yield back. 
Yeah, I'm going to go to Mr. Amity, but first, uh, uh, regarding resiliency, one thing that um, that uh, is what's going on in Puerto Rico, for instance, uh, even though uh, people would like to see a, a system built to a five-category hurricane, uh, that may not be practical. It may not be practical uh, what, the, what the Virgin Islands are proposing. But one thing that can be done uh, as someone who's built things is when you when you're building things like foundations and uh, footings uh, drainage uh, that's one thing you know it's it's where you where if you lose the building but the foundation and the footings are still there you can rebuild on the on that footprint that that uh, saves a tremendous amount of money that that uh, is doesn't really cost that much more money to do and uh, that's something that ought to be Analyze as you go into these things, but uh, I just bring that up as a, a point, Mr. Amaday. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Morning, David. Sure. Um, you've talked about money for expedited permitting from SHPOs, State Historic Preservation Officers. Um, so I'm assuming that we don't need money for expedited permitting from any agencies in the Department of Interior. Or is that an is that an incorrect assumption? So um, the Section 106 money, I, I think that um, you're, you're correct in that um, we believe that we have what we need. Okay. I'd have to make sure if the, any of that is, would actually be retained by the Park Service, and it may be. Okay. Um, well, my only concern, potential concern, is, is if, we're, if we're plussing up permitting activities within our own agency, to allow a different part of our own agency to do it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. I would just say that that might be something that needs to be pretty fully fleshed out so that we're not saying we did that. So if, if, if that's an issue later on, then, then get back with me. State shippos are, are good things, stuff like that. But when we talk about what things cost, and it's like the shippo comes back and says, hey, wrong kind of siding or wrong kind of light fixtures or whatever, that could have an impact on what this costs, right? Well, it certainly could have an impact on what those individual um, uh, uh, owners are, are doing, et cetera, absolutely. Okay, so, so I guess we need a footnote in there that just says, hey, well, if, if the shippos beat us up in these seven states, we'll come back to you. I assume that would be the process, right? If you're out of... Yeah, I mean, we certainly are prepared to come back to you for anything we need. Absolutely. Well, well I, and listen, I'm not anticipating that, but if that happens, it would be nice to know that it's like, hey, guess what? We got into a big wrestling match, I'm just speaking hypothetically, with the SHPO for XYZ jurisdiction, and guess what? What we thought was going to cost a million bucks is now a $3 million bill, and in the, in the State Historic uh, Preserv or, or the National Historic Preservation Act, we haven't got a way out. I'm also concerned in that in terms of if there's a disaster if there needs to be something that's the equivalent of a nationwide whatever exemption or something for federal facilities to do their thing, because I'm assuming the fact that you've asked for that means that isn't in that statute right now. Um, well, I think this is more, this request is more for um, recognizing that these, um, there is going to be a need to do greater CHIPA work, not for our stuff. Uh, but for the stuff of um, pi private owners, owners and others. And as a result of the National Historic Preservation Act, somebody's house may have been devastated, and so they're going to have a lot more. When they go deal with the SHPO, there's going to be a bigger line there than normal. And so this is to facilitate, help facilitate that SHPO being able to move quicker um, so that the line is not as long. Okay. It's not really designed for us. Um, for what we uh, do on our properties. So, so then, th then I guess that leads me to the next one. Is can you give me a feel for how much of this is for, for no kidding, U.S. owned properties, whether it's parks, interior, wildlife, whoever, and what is for leased properties, which the U.S. does not own? Um, because in terms know, of in terms of the facilities, I would have to come back to you with an okay. answer to that because I, I want to say the vast lion's share of what we're asking for. If it says construction, if it says facilities, if it says a debris, debris, debris removal, removal, those are happening on our properties, okay? With the exception that obviously USGS Dream Gauge is all, all over. But to be honest, I am, 
aware that at least in Puerto Rico, for example, the building that USGS operates is a rental. Um, so there are some lease leaseholds that okay. we would be working with. And I guess the context of the question, t to make it even more clear, is, is I would hope that the leases that the department has entered into, especially in areas that are prone to flooding, wind, and blah, 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 talk about whose responsibility it is to fix those. And if you end up having to fix it for a landlord, that we have a recovery mechanism so that we're not exposed to we paid to fix Amaday's rental property that he's leasing out I, to XYZ. That's a very good point. I will look into it. Uh, okay. Uh, would, would the gentleman yield? Sure. Because the part of, well, and, and I understand you doing triage and prioritizing, and we expect that from you, and we're glad you do that. But um, the Historic Preservation Fund uh, has grants, uh, and you have, uh, you know, which which means that there's there's a match on it. It's a it, it's it's a grant. Um, it is my understanding in this supplemental, whereas in past hurricanes, both Sandy and Katrina, and these are our fellow citizens. These are our territories. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, in it, past hurricanes, both Sandy and Katrina. Um, the Congress provided uh, f uh, $50 million for historic preservation fund grants. It's my understanding that um, at this point in time, on this supplemental, that is zero a recommendation from the administration. And I think, I think we're in agreement that we should start talking about making these grants uh, available sooner rather than later or, or maybe never. So is that correct? You're at zero? And I, if so, are you planning in the future for asking for what we did for other hurricanes? And, and you might need to go back. I know everybody's still crunching numbers, but I think you've heard from several of us that we don't know why we're treating um, this uh, supplemental so differently. Well, I'll be very honest with you, and I'm pretty certain that you're correct in your assumption of zero. Um, and I would uh, tell you that this is our request. Just one more thing, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yep, and, and, and this kind of follows on on that. I, I have heard and understand the discussion on, on um, hardening of infrastructure and even the habitat-related one and all that, and that's fine. I would just say that, that, that part of me thinks, and from your background you'll understand this, that there, are, there will be those of us watching in anticipation of passing meaningful uh, legislation regarding other natural disasters which may one day include fires. And so when we talk about restoring habitats in areas with endangered species or that telephone poles burn sometimes and we think maybe it would be better to put them underground, and, and I'm just throwing that out there off the top of my head. That, that this will be precedent setting as far as how we, re, re, you know, di different, different hardening is in different environments. And so I'll just throw that out and say, I'm looking forward to seeing how you folks do this and, and it ought to be fun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Kaptur. You got your mic? Okay. All right. Thank you very much for being here, for your experience and for your work. Um, how capable is the government of Puerto Rico in planning for its own future and the rebuilding of the island? Or through the funding that we provide, do we have to assure that there are expert land planners? I haven't seen it in all the hearings we've been in on our energy subcommittee, on this subcommittee. This is the first map I've seen that even, I mean, this is like 1 percent of what we need in order to intelligently plan rebuilding. Uh, and I support the money for USGS, the $20 million plus that's in here. Excellent decision there. But who's actually in charge of the planning? You've got a really complex topographical and geologic situation here, uh, quite unusual, different than Texas, different than Florida. And um, I keep asking the question, who are the key, where is the key land planning lodged? Who's doing that? How would you, how do you answer that question? Um, well, I try and answer that question very honestly. And um, my first point would be that the one place I know it's not lodged is the Department of the Interior. Um, okay. uh, right. But, but that, that said, um, uh, the, the, in general, uh, if we were dealing with your home state, that would all be very clear, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, 
And so I think that that is um, a bit of um, what I spoke about earlier in terms of the magnitude of, of, of dealing with this particular uh, a challenge. Now, those, um, you know, it's very easy for us at Interior to account for the properties that we um, manage and administer. Could you it, superimpose? We don't have a map. I, I don't have a map of that after I don't know how many hearings we've had. You know what? Uh, I, I certainly um, should be able, and I'm going to say should so I don't let you down, but, but I should be able to give you a map of, of uh, Puerto Rico and anywhere else you want uh, that has um, where our, our holdings primarily are. I'll just are. share with you that when we had Army Corps before us on the Energy Committee, you know, they gave us a map with none of this some lines, you know, sort of showing us where maybe the grid might be restored. I think I'm and, familiar with that. You know, map. but it doesn't, the elevation, the streams, because I keep saying to myself the question, oh, okay, so if this is vulnerable again, what about geothermal? Does that make sense? And if so, where? So if we're going to be doing something in the National Park or restoring whatever here, that you can wheel out power to other places, because obviously the islands vary, you know, 1950s in terms of its uh, infrastructure. And, um, but I don't really, I guess what's got me more and more concerned as I sit here in these hearings is, it's fragmented. There isn't really a team that has a leader that thinks about how you put the components the, together. The, the way it's actually set up now as we move into the recovery is FEMA will continue to be the leader, I believe. And then um, we have, for example, we have a very specific role in the longer term recovery and that role is basically uh, natural resources, natural and cultural resources. That falls to us. And the strategy does have different players with different um, pieces. And who has that team? Uh, who, who determines the team? Which or? human being in the United States of America's government heads I, that I, I can, team? I, I can get you that name um, this afternoon. Okay. You think they're lodged at FEMA? I'm certain of that. Okay. Um, I have uh, another question uh, dealing with two topics that do not relate to rebuilding here. One is uh, whether the department intends to double the entry fees for national parks, for selected national parks. Is that still a front burner item there or have you sort of become more reasonable? Well, um, I, I believe that we extended the comment period. Um, the comment period is extended for a while. We'll get additional comment. After we get a comment, which is a, uh, on a proposal to raise fees at 15 parks, after we get that comment, we'll address the comment and I'm sure make a decision and communicate with you at that time. All right, very good. I'm glad it's under review. Um, I don't think the American people should be saddled with higher fees in view of everything. You know, in my area, people haven't had a raise in 20 years. And sometimes the national parks are the only place that they, that's where they go for vacations, and sometimes they don't go to Denali because they can't afford the gas to get out there. Uh, but, uh, you know, even the dunes up in Michigan and places like that, you know, that it's, it's expensive to travel. So um, uh, I kept thinking, well, probably because our national parks are so overcrowded, they're charging an entry fee to keep people out. Uh, I mean, you know, you want to regulate, uh, that's oh. what the Russians would do. It's a it's 15 uh, make it parks. harder to get someplace. I hope we're not going that direction in this country. Uh, we'd like our people to enjoy uh, the natural resources of this country. We need to increase your budget so that you have uh, uh, the kind of staffing and the improvements that are needed at these parks. So that's my point of view. Uh, but uh, my second question is, what about uh, our, is the department reconsidering the import of trophy elephants based on what the president has done? Uh, is it rescinded? The, um, the department is absolutely um, uh, reviewing the program um, across the board and, um, and absolutely doing that. All right. So, okay. re you put a stay on it for the moment then? So um, the, as it relates to uh, Zimbabwe, um, there was a um, su suspension of an endangerment finding um, that was uh, modified and that has been um, resuspended. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Chum. you. Um, we got into to Ms. Captor talked about maps, and I, you know, uh, obviously concerned about 
what's going on, uh, not just uh, because of the recent hurricanes, and uh, part of this $20 million for the uh, USGS is to uh, potentially uh, collect data uh, that, uh, that would be helpful in the future uh, for we can model for future events. And as you may know, uh, 245,000 acres in Northern California, uh, 8,900 structures, 6,900 of those were homes. Uh, that environment was uh, significantly disrupted. And uh, we uh, hope that there would be value uh, in collecting a three-dimensional evaluation, elevation mapping data for these areas affected by the wildfires. Uh, the USGS 3D elevation program typically partners with state and local uh, entities who share costs of acquiring that data, as you know. Uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are not capable of uh, you know, right. doing that, so uh, we need to make sure we get this uh, data collected. Uh, they're unable because of, they're both bankrupt, it's pretty well known, uh, in getting a cost-sharing agreement from uh, from a stone is impossible. So uh, I would hope that uh, that we would also look at, though, at uh, California. You may want to comment a little bit about California uh, while you're here, David. So, so I, don't, um, I don't have anything in our request as it relates to that specifically, but I do know that that data would be very helpful and very important. Yeah. Um, elevation plays a key role um, uh, in um, assessments of um, the speed of which things move, et cetera, and it would be helpful information to have. Right. Uh, I, my uh, prediction, of course, is that uh, this is not going to be the last supplemental. Uh, we're going to hopefully do the supplemental soon. Uh, we'll be working together to uh, look at your proposal and the administration's proposal and our, from the interior perspective uh, and try to, to uh, fashion something that, uh, that uh, is going to work, and then we'll be looking down the road at uh, what hasn't been evaluated because I know that not all the evaluations have been done. That's true. And uh, we, uh, we need to look at this uh, uh, seriously and see what we can do uh, about this uh, in the future, uh, future supplemental that we'll, we'll have. With that, uh, Ms. McCollum, do you have any additional questions or uh, comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is more of just putting this on the record. Um, you know, it's uh, it's clear that uh, citizens of this country expect uh, to be treated fairly and with equity. And um, the citizens in the, in the uh, uh, two areas that we've been focused on, mostly the Virgin Islands and the Puerto Rico um, uh, Islands, have, have found themselves uh, with um, uh, formulas and um, uh, cost shares in the past that have impacted dramatically, um, I'd, I'd say punitively, uh, our fellow citizens on, in, in, in both of uh, these territories. And as the chairman pointed out, uh, and as we do quite often on the Appropriations Committee, we're trying to equalize that um, all across the board, not just in, just, not just in um, our appropriations uh, subcommittee, but in others. And so when it comes to waivers and cross-sharing, um, I would hope that the Department of Insular Affairs would work with us to point out where these inequities and these injustices lie, to do something about it, and also, as the chairman pointed out, take, take into account um, that many of our fellow citizens in, in these territories, um, their, their governments, um, you know, can't do these matches, can't do, the, can't do these waivers. So it sounds good on paper, but what we're actually delivering to our fellow citizens might fall far short. Um, with that, um, both, the, both the chairman and I serve on the Department of Defense, and so um, I've been bringing this up every time, and um, I just want to know where we are with the Viegas Island uh, cleanup. Um, that shouldn't fall on the Department of Interior when it's uh, unexploded ordinance um, and, uh, and that. So I know that people were working together to get an assessment on that. If you could uh, either elaborate it on it uh, today 
uh, and let me know uh, how it's going with the Department of Defense. I, Mr. Chairman, I'm speaking for both of us right now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you and I'd be happy to bring both parties together, uh, being on both committees, uh, Interior and Defense, to make sure this is done in an expedited uh, uh, fashion and that the Department of Defense um, expedites anything it needs to do in the cleanup on that. It should not fall solely on the Department of Interior to take uh, the, the lead when you have so many other things to do there. So anything you want to enlighten the Chair and I about or I, uh, anything, we stand ready to help you. I will commit that if we have problems, we'll come talk to both of you on that. And I'm very sensitive to the California stuff and we'll work with you on that. What's that, Mr. What's that? Do you have an additional question, Mr. Yes, okay, no additional, no additional question. Well, thank you. I appreciate your uh, coming out here today, and uh, good luck. Uh, you know, I know you just started. You got a lot of work to do, but uh, thanks for what you're doing, and uh, we'll see you soon. And we're adjourned. Thank you.